and bid you a happy St. Valentine's Day. I like to say St. Valentine's Day because this uh, day has its origins in the Christian faith and in the love of God. It's easy to forget that on the biggest day of chocolate sales in the air. The uh, biggest time of flower sales and candy and whatnot. But it is indeed the love of God that makes St. Valentine's Day worth celebrating. Right? And, <clears throat> you know, sometimes people talk about coordinating the various parts of the worship service so that they fit a singular theme. And, and you can do that, but I prefer to <coughs> kind of let the Spirit do that. And so when I uh, was planning my messages throughout Lent, I have to be honest with you and say, I did not remember that this was St. Valentine's Day. So the fact that we're talking about love on St. Valentine's Day is not the result of careful planning. It's the result of the spirit leading. And uh, it, it's just wonderfully appropriate. Now, I've learned today uh, that people are turning to the Bible to find out what love is about at this time of year. And the evidence is there on the internet. More people have searched for the word love at the, the website Bible Gateway than any other word last year. It remained consistently at the top of the rankings throughout the year. In addition, the phrases love one another and love is patient were among Bible Gateway's 25 most searched words and phrases last year. And they became the second and third most searched terms prior to Valentine's Day last year. And on a broader scale, two phrases, uh, those two phrases, along with the phrase God is love, spiked on Google searches last year in mid-February as well. So there's evidence that people are in our culture, are turning to God's Word, to the Bible, to find out what love's about. And that, to paraphrase a country song, is looking for love in all the right places. Amen? Amen. We're going to turn this morning in God's Word to Ephesians chapter 5, and we're going to read verses 1 to 7. The uh, reading, if you haven't turned there already, is on page 1817 in your pew Bible. Ephesians chapter 5, we're going to start with verse 1. And in this whole section of living as children of light, God says to us the importance of love. Be imitators of God, therefore, as dearly loved children, and live a life of love, just as Christ loved us, and gave himself up for us as a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. But among you there must not be even a hint of sexual immorality or any kind of impurity or greed because these are improper for God's holy people. Nor should there be any obscenity, foolish talk, or coarse joking which are out of place, but rather thanksgiving. For of this you can be sure. No immoral, impure, or greedy person, such a man as an idolater, has any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. Let no one deceive you with empty words, because of such things God's wrath comes down on those who are disobedient. Therefore, do not be partners with them. May God add the blessing that is only his to give upon the reading of his word. The message notes are on the 
pink Valentine's Day color sheet in your bulletin. And what we're going to be doing during the Sundays of Lent is we're going to be asking the question over and over again, why did he do it? Why did Jesus lay down his life on the cross? Jesus made it plain to us that he did not have his life taken from him, but instead he surrendered it. He gave it up. So that begs the question, why? And what we're going to find from Scripture is that there are lots of reasons why. And the first and most important of these is because he loves you. He did it for love. We notice first in this passage that Jesus gave his life on the cross because he loved us. Go to verse 2. And it says, just as Christ loved us. This is the key. This is how we understand the motive for Jesus allowing himself to be sacrificed on the cross. Those four letters. Love us. It was love that made him do it. We see also, as, as Paul explains here, that he gave himself up for us. So this was a deliberate act. It was a, a self-sacrifice. And on that note, Paul says that it was a fragrant offering. A fragrant offering. Now we need to go back to the Old Testament to understand what that means. Outside the temple, outside the tabernacle, outside the place of worship in the Jewish faith, there was a bronze altar upon which sacrifices were burned. That's how they were offered to God. And so Paul is trying to get his readers to recollect the smoke that would rise into the air. Now, you and I have, uh, I assume, done some grilling uh, over the years, and the, the smell of, of that uh, offering of meat, we're not offering it to God at that point, are we? But the, the smell is wonderful. You know, even a Burger King smells pretty good some days. Uh, and we've got a steak out up here, and when the wind's out of the northwest, it's, it's hard to concentrate on what's going on that wonderful smell, a fragrant offering. The Bible also says that the prayers of the saints rise up to God as a fragrant offering. We're also to picture here the incense that was offered inside the temple, inside the tabernacle, and how the smoke from the burning incense would rise. And these are symbols of sacrifices that are made. And way back in the book of Genesis, chapter 8, verse 21, after the flood, Noah sacrificed to God. And, and it says in that text that the smell of the sacrifice rose up, and God smelled it. Now, God is a spirit. He doesn't have nostrils. But you understand? It's the obedience of a sacrifice offered in faith with a sincere heart that pleases God the Father. The word translated as offering here was very familiar among the Jews of that time. It appears over 40 times in the Old Testament, first five books of the Old Testament, and it is specifically the peace offering. It is an offering made to make peace between man and God, between people and God the Father. So Jesus is our peace offering. Paul also writes that Jesus is a sacrifice to God, a sacrifice to him. William Barclay, commenting on this passage, wrote, What was that sacrifice? It was a life of perfect obedience to God and perfect love to men. Obedience so absolute and love so infinite that he, Jesus, accepted it. From Genesis to Revelation, God reveals that the penalty for sin is death. That when we sin, we deserve to die. It's that serious. But in the Old Testament system, God said that the way that the penalty could be paid is that a life 
would be poured out. And God said that the life of the creature is in its blood. We can testify to that, can't we? No blood, no life. I've tried a couple of times to donate blood, and that alone <laughs> about made me faint. In fact, uh, the third, after the third time I tried it, the nurse said, look, you can't handle it any better than this, don't come back. <laughs> so I took her at her word. <laughs> I guess she didn't want to pick up a, a, a six foot two, 280 pound guy. The life of the creatures in its blood, and so the sacrifice of blood was the pouring out of a life to counter the death, to pay for the death. And in the Old Testament system, it was it was well, on a one for one kind of basis: one life poured out and and one death forgiven. But on the cross of Jesus Christ, it was good for all persons of all times and all places. The final and complete peace offering us and God. The word translated as sacrifice, as I said, is that peace offering. That's what Jesus did for us, and that's why he did it. Now the question is, what should we do in return? What is our response? And, and Paul is very plain and very specific about what our response is. Our response is to imitate that love. Not to do the same thing. There's only need of one cross. But to imitate the kind of love that led Jesus to offer himself. And so he writes in verse 1, be imitators of God. And think for a moment about that. Imitating God. We don't have the power of God. We don't have the wisdom of God. And and so to imitate God would be impossible for us, wouldn't it? It is, frankly. To imitate God is impossible. It looks like it's set up to fail. However, it's not, and it makes a world of sense when we understand that you aim high, you achieve more. Right? That's an aspect of human nature. So set, God is setting before us the highest standard, the most uh, wonderful goal, so that we will achieve more as we attempt to do it. But spiritually speaking, and most importantly, God did not set that before us and say, go get him, tiger. God has given us his Holy Spirit, who gives us wisdom, who gives us power. Who, he has also given us his word, so that we don't have to make it up we follow what the Word says. So the question then is, why should we be imitators of God? And in verse 1, Paul supplies us with a couple of reasons. The first is that we are dearly loved children. We're dearly loved children. As I said earlier, we're adopted into the family of God. And so in gratitude, we should be motivated to return that love to God, right? When you are loved, you want to love in return, and that's the way it should be. But on a more familiar level, we observe how children imitate their parents, right? It's so cute when they imitate our good points. It's not so cute when they imitate our bad points. Or maybe use some language that uh, a little too savory for young. Where did they hear that? Having and demonstrating our love, here's another reason, folks, is how we prove two things. Demonstrating love is how we prove that God is real. And second, that he's in us. We can make all kinds of demonstrations and protests. We can learn how to make arguments and, and and dialogue with people and try to convince them of the faith, but if we don't live a life of love, then what effect will it have? Can we change their mind? Maybe. But not their life. We need to live that life of love. The Greek word that's translated as imitators is commonly used of Greek philosophers 
who would teach their philosophy by this very simple method. You repeat everything I say. You do everything I do. You believe everything I do. And so the disciple or the student would spend time with the teacher doing exactly what the teacher did and said and thought. I had a class in Bible college where that's what the theology professor expected of us. And when it came time for a test, what he wanted to read on the paper was his own words. He, didn't, he wasn't concerned about what we believe. <laughs> he was concerned about what he believed and that we had learned what he believed. We were to be imitators of Stan Richardson. Now the good news is he had great theology and he was a great man and imitating him was a good idea. But if you didn't do it, you didn't do so well in his course. And so God says to us, imitate. Through Moses, God commanded, be holy, for I, the Lord your God, am holy. Through Jesus, he commanded, be perfect, even as your Father in heaven is perfect. Be merciful, even as your Father in heaven is merciful. Through Paul, God commanded, forgive one another, just as God in Christ forgave you. And if all of that weren't reason enough, simple fact that God said so is reason enough for all. God said, love, imitate my love. And that's reason enough for us to do. Finally, we need to ask then, as we respond to the command of being imitators of God, how do we do that? And again, Paul offers us two pieces of advice. He says first, in verse 2, live a life of love. Love is the essential characteristic of who God is. And so if we're imitating Him, what should be the essential characteristic of our love? That you know. It's love. When people look at who we are, when they listen to what we say, when they look at what we do, what should be in the forefront? We love. As we imitate God, we need to love. Living a life of love means having love at the center of our character. It's not something that we put on and, and, and perform. It's not something that we do only in certain situations. It's the essential expression of who we are. Friends, that doesn't come overnight. It doesn't come by accident. It comes over time, with the help of the Spirit, and with thousands of choices to say, what I want doesn't matter, what's needed, what is loving, that's what I'll do. The second thing Paul wrote is that we are to imitate God by loving just as Christ loved. Following the example of sacrifice. Obedience to God and sacrifice to benefit others are the ways that His love appears in us. We're to live a life of love just as Christ loved us. Now I mentioned earlier that uh, it's a, it, to me, it's more fun when, when God plans something and uh, it happens. And, and another example of that in today's service is that I did not know Pastor Jackie was going to sing for us. And so I thought at the conclusion of my sermon, wouldn't it be neat if she came forward and read 1 Corinthians 13 to us in Spanish? So, <laughs> again, what looks like great planning is not. It's simply the work of the Spirit and uh, God doing something. So I'm going to invite Pastor Jack, if you would, to just come right now. And you can only stand here. And uh, as we listen to Pastor Jack, you read this. And this was something that I discovered uh, taking a small part in the Martin Luther King Jr. 
celebrations earlier this year, was that when you hear it, these familiar words of scripture in another language, it bypasses your head and hits your heart. May that be your experience as Jackie comes. Just a moment. Just a moment. Thank mm -hmm. you. 